You've asked for videos on configuring ACLs and NAT on the ASA firewalls from the command line. We've already looked at ACLs, so in this video we're going to continue the adventure by looking at NAT. Let's get right to it. We'll use the same basic topology as we did in the last video, but this time we're making it more realistic by using public IP addresses. Also to add to the realism, I've removed the ISP router's routes to the private subnets. Remember that private addresses are not allowed on the internet. It's important to realize that we're using modern ASA. NAT changed dramatically when version 8.3 came onto the scene. It's rare to see ASA is older than this now. I only mention it as there's still lots of documentation for pre 8.3 out there, and in some ways it's quite a bit different. I'm also assuming that you have at least a passing knowledge of what NAT is, and you're here to see how it works specifically with the ASA. We won't cover every possible scenario because there's a lot of them, but we will get a good understanding of the ASA's viewpoint on NAT. Following along with this lab is a good idea. So you can build your own, but if you are a Patreon supporter, you can download a pre-built viral or GNS3 lab or even the raw configuration files, which will really save you some time. There's seven things that we want to achieve in this lab. First, we want to prevent NAT between the inside network and the DMZ. We want to give the DMZ intranet server its own public IP and configure a separate public IP for the workstation's general internet use. After that, we're going to change it up and use a pool of IPs for the workstations instead of a single IP. Workstation 2 has a web page and we'd like it to be available on the internet on port 8080. Workstation 1 is responsible for administering the ISP router, so we want to exclude it from NAT, but only when SSHing to the router. And finally, we're going to rewrite DNS responses from the DNS server to the internet. Before we hit the lab, let's take a brief moment to go over how the ASA handles NAT. Just like an iOS router, you have inside and outside interfaces. These interfaces don't have to be named inside and outside anywhere in the configuration. Any name is fine, these are just logical concepts. Normally, an inside network is one that we want to protect with the ASA. The outside is typically an untrusted network like the internet. The good thing is that unlike a router, you don't have to hard code each interface with inside and outside statements. The inside and outside are defined with each NAT rule, so what we consider inside and outside can change on a rule by rule basis. On the inside interface, we use real addresses. This is the real IP address of a host that we want to translate. On the outside interface, we define mapped addresses, which is the IP address after it has been translated. This could be a public IP on the internet, for example. NAT can work in two directions. It can be initiated from the host on the inside network, or it can be initiated from a host on the outside network. If a NAT rule allows a translation to be initiated from either side, then this is called bidirectional NAT. Some NAT rules only allow traffic to be initiated from the inside, that is, from the host with the real IP address. This is called unidirectional NAT. Don't let me confuse you though, once traffic is initiated and the NAT is in place, return traffic from the outside is okay. Unidirectional just means that traffic can only be initiated in one particular direction. All packets have an IP header, and in the IP header are the source and destination IP addresses. One type of NAT, called source NAT, changes the source IP address. This is probably the most common form of NAT. Another type of NAT is called destination NAT, and as the name suggests, this changes the destination IP address. The ASA supports both source and destination NAT. We can even have both in the same rule if we want to. Our intranet server needs a public IP. It needs exclusive use of this IP, and the IP should never change. The type of NAT we want to configure is called static NAT. Traffic may be initiated from the internet or from the server itself, which is bidirectional NAT. We only want to change the server's IP address, so this is called source NAT. 
When we think of the source and destination, we always think from the perspective of the host on the inside network. Let me show you that the web server can't reach our public IP. And that's what we're going to fix here. The NAT we're configuring is based around network objects, which we saw in the last video. I like to start by creating a network object for the mapped IP first. This is just an object with the public IP address. Next, we'll create the network object for the intranet server. This represents the server's real IP address. Remember to use descriptions whenever you can. We can create NAT within this object. We need to tell it which interfaces represent the inside and outside. It's always inside, then outside. Keep that in mind. And in our case, the inside is the DMZ interface. We could use any as the outside if we wanted. This would mean that NAT would be applied for any egress interface. But we don't want to do that though, as we don't want NAT between the DMZ and inside interfaces. We only want it between DMZ and outside, so we specify the outside interface here. And after the interfaces, we use the static keyword. This tells the ASA that this should be a static NAT. And finally, we give it the mapped IP object. I like to choose the names of my objects around what they're used for. For mapped IPs, I add the word public to the object name. For the real IP, I like to add the name of the interface that the NAT occurs on. So as we're NATing to the outside interface, I would add outside to the object name. You don't have to follow this naming convention, but try to choose something that makes sense to you as it will help you with troubleshooting later. Now we can go back to the web server and confirm that we can reach the intranet server, which we can. Now we want to configure the firewall to allow internet access from the inside network. Right now this doesn't work as they don't have any public IP addresses. Remember that private IP addresses are not allowed on the internet, which is why we need to give them a public IP. We can configure a single public IP for all the hosts on the inside network. We do this to conserve the number of public IPs that we're using. This is called a port address translation and gives each flow of traffic the same IP address, but a different source port. This allows about 64,000 translations for a single public IP. As each flow of traffic uses different and unpredictable ports, traffic must be initiated from the host inside the network. This makes it a unidirectional NAT. Let's continue by creating a few network objects. The first one defines the internal subnet. The commands are fairly straightforward. The second defines a single mapped IP. Now outside of the network objects, we start defining our NAT rule. Just like before, we need to tell it which interfaces are inside and outside the network. We could use any as the inside if we wanted to. Coincidentally though, we want to use the interfaces named inside and outside. We follow this up with source dynamic, which tells the ASA that this is dynamic NAT with the inside subnet object as the source addresses. These are the real IPs. If we want, we could choose to NAT to the IP address of one of the ASA's interfaces. This is another way we can conserve an additional IP address. However, we're going to use the mapped IP that we defined in the internet pat object. Of course, a description is always a good idea. We still have an ACL entry configured that only allows access to the internet server. Uh, this one was configured in the last video. So we're going to remove it and replace it with a rule that allows general internet access. You should be pretty familiar with how this is done by now. If we look at the workstation, we can see that we can ping the web server on the internet as well as retrieve a web page. In addition to this, the second workstation can also access the internet using the same NAT rule. There are some occasions where a single public IP address is not enough. If you have a large network, you might exhaust all the ports on the IP addresses, 
or if you have an ASA cluster, you need a unique public IP for each of the cluster nodes. I have a video on that if you want to see it. Also, some security devices will see a lot of requests coming from a single IP address and think that it is the source of an attack. So using a few different IPs can change that up a bit. So our alternative is to translate to a pool of IPs instead of to a single IP. This is still a unidirectional translation. This type of rule doesn't need to use port translation, but it is quite common. So we start this by removing the rule that we just created. But don't worry, we'll put the new one in place very soon. Now we'll create an object with a pool of two IP addresses. Notice that these are configured as a range, which means that they need to be consecutive. This is where good IP space planning pays off. Finally, we add the NAT rule back in with a few small changes. Instead of just using the object with the mapped IPs, we need to include the pat pool keyword first and then the object. If we test this on the workstations again, we see that they still have internet access. You might be wondering how we can verify what we've configured so far and what translations are currently active. If you are wondering that, I have two excellent commands for you. The first is show xlate. This shows active translations on the ASA. Static translations stay there permanently, while dynamic will expire after some inactivity shown by the timeout value. You'll notice that there are one or more flags on each entry. This will tell you a bit about the NAT. You can use the table listed above to decode their meaning. When we use PAT rules, we will see an entry for each connection through the firewall. The ones here are listed as ICMP because of all the pinging we've been doing. The next command is show NAT detail. This shows us the NAT rules as they are configured. They are broken into sections one, two, and three. We only see sections one and two here as we don't have any rules in section three. Each rule has a list of translate hits and untranslate hits. The translate hit counter is incremented when a new connection is translated, starting from the inside network heading towards the outside. An untranslate hit is seen when the connection started from the outside network heading to the inside. But let's focus on the sections for now. How do these work? You can see here that the ASA will divide the NAT rules into three sections. Section one and three are manual NAT, while section two is auto NAT. Why is it like this? It follows this structure so we can make NAT rules form a kind of policy. To make up this policy, we have two types of NAT, which are called object NAT and twice NAT. Object NAT is the type we configured earlier where we added the NAT rule directly into the network object. Each object with NAT configuration becomes a separate rule in the auto NAT section. Object NAT is simple to configure and it's easy to understand and make changes later on. Twice NAT is the type of NAT that we configured when we enabled general internet access. Remember how there were a lot more options to configure? That's because twice NAT is much more capable than object NAT. It can match conditions based on source and destination, and if needed, it can translate the source and destination addresses into a single rule. For example, it can match source A to destination B and apply a translation. It can also use a separate rule to match source A to destination C and apply a completely different translation. So twice NAT rules are very useful if you want to apply different translations to the same host, depending on certain conditions. Twice NAT rules can go into sections one and three. If you're having trouble remembering twice NAT, just think about how the rules can be applied in two different sections. Here is my recommendation. Try to use object NAT wherever you can. If there's a situation that won't work with object NAT, then try and use a twice NAT rule. Now, if you're willing to use the ASDM, you can see all of this visually, just as I've described it. It's okay to like the CLI, 
but don't be afraid to use the ASDM. It is a useful tool. On an ASA, NAT rules are evaluated in a particular order, just like the access control entries are. These sections provide this order. Section 1 is evaluated first, then Section 2, and finally Section 3. When a match is found, an action is taken, and no further rules are evaluated. If no match is found, no translation is performed. Object NAT rules use a strange order. The ASA looks at static NAT entries first. If there's no match, dynamic rules are evaluated next. Within sections 1 and 3, twice NAT rules are evaluated in order from the top down. By default, twice NAT rules are added to the end of the list in section 1. We'll see how to add to section 3 very soon. So, why are there two sections for twice NAT? This enables us to control the order of NAT rules and create policies. That's what makes the ASA style of NAT much more advanced than a regular iOS router. To see this in action, we're going to move our general internet access rule from section one to section three. The first part is to remove the rule. The second part is to add the rule back in with the after auto keyword. This way, it's only applied after other rules have had a chance to be evaluated. If we run show NAT detail again, we can see the rule in section 3. One of our goals is to translate Workstation 2's web server from port 80 to the non-standard port 8080. I just want to say that I don't recommend exposing an internal device directly to the internet. That's what the DMZ network's for. I also recommend using HTTPS instead of HTTP. So we're doing this just to show you how it's done. This is a form of static NAT and it will be bi-directional as we're changing ports. This is called static NAT with port translation. This is best done with an object NAT. As usual, we start by creating the network object for the mapped IP. Then we create the object for the real IP. Just as we've done before, we add the NAT rule into the object. This time, we use the service keyword, which is the ASA's fancy way of saying that we're dealing with ports. We need to include the real port used on the inside first, then the mapped port that we're translating to on the outside. Remember, it's always inside than outside. Finally, we need an ACL to make this work. In the ACL, we need to use the object with the real IP. Remember to always use the real IP and not the mapped one. In addition, we need to use the real port. This may seem backward, but the key is to remember to always use the real IP and the real port. And just to confirm that this works, we can try accessing the web page on port 8080. We have an odd requirement where Workstation 1 needs to be able to administer the ISP router with SSH. Let's say that this router is ours and it's used to connect to the ISP. So our requirement is that we access the router using the Workstation's real IP. This allows the router to permit or deny traffic based on a unique IP address if we want to. If we didn't do this, all traffic coming out of the internal network would use the IPs from the dynamic pool, which makes router security more difficult. So we need to bypass NAT for this traffic. We don't want to bypass NAT for any other traffic, just SSH between the workstation and the router. The solution is identity NAT. This is where a NAT rule uses the real IP address as the mapped IP. This is also known as NAT exclusion or NAT bypass. Old documentation might call this NAT zero, but ignore that as therefore ASAs that come before version 8.3, which did NAT very differently. Another common use for this is when you have a VPN. You generally don't want NAT to apply when sending traffic through the VPN tunnel, so you would use an identity NAT to keep the IPs the same. This is actually some very simple configuration. We'll just use an object NAT for this one. 
Start by defining the object for the real IP. There's no need to configure an object for any mapped IP in this case. For the NAT configuration, just make it static and use the real IP as the mapped IP. And that's all there is to it. This rule will go into section two, so we can be sure that we'll be evaluated before our general internet access rule that we previously moved to section three. You see how those sections are working out for us now? A bit of thought ahead of time can make all the difference. We'll quickly throw in an ACL entry to allow access to the router on SSH. And we would do a quick test. I should also quickly mention that the router has a host route for Workstation 1 pointing to the ASA. I'm not showing that part because we're just focusing on the ASA in this video. And if we SSH to the router, it works right away. One last goal to go. We need to think about DNS. Our intranet server is a DNS server, but what happens when a server on the internet does a lookup? Let's have a look at this. On the web server, I'm going to quickly change the DNS settings to point to the intranet server. Hmm. Mm-hmm, something's going wrong here. The contents of the file are not showing up in my terminal session correctly. If I scroll up, I can see it. I'm not really sure what's going on with this, but with a bit of fiddling, it looks like I've got it. Let's use the dig command to retrieve the DNS record for the internet server. See how the IP address is the internal IP? From the outside, we really need this to be the public IP, but the Linux server doesn't know that there's a NAT in place. One solution is to build a second DNS server that is just for public use. It would contain all the same DNS records, but it would have public IP addresses, not private ones. This is called split DNS, and it is absolutely a valid solution. But this video is on ASA, so we're gonna look at option number two, and that is DNS rewriting. We can configure the ASA to look at the contents of the DNS response. When it sees the IP address 172.16.0.1, it can then rewrite this to the public IP 200.111. Now this might sound really complicated, but it's probably the easiest thing we've done so far. We're going to edit the internet server's network object. While we're in there, we'll enter the NAT configuration again, but this time we add the DNS keyword to the end of the line. And that is it. It really is that simple. So now to confirm that it works, over to the internet web server to run dig again, and look at that, it's returning the public IP now. Don't forget that you can use Packet Tracer to simulate traffic going through the ASA. If you want a refresher, take a look at the ACL video. And that brings us to the end of ACLs and NAT on the ASA. Hopefully I've covered what you wanted to see. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And if you do some of these things differently, tell me about it. I'd like to hear about the alternatives. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, so you can see new content when it's available, and I hope to see you in another video.